So I was going to talk about um, safety and people multimorbidity. I'm, I'm going to cover a quite, quite a lot of ground fairly quickly, but I'm hoping to finish soon enough that we can then have some questions and discussion at the end. Um, so what I was going to talk about was, um, so, I mean, the, you know, what's the challenge of multimorbidity, um, what might health services do in general, and then I'm going to focus in a little bit on safety improvement in primary care. So I'm a GP by background, that's what I do clinically, um, and then focus in a bit more on prescribing. And so, so one of the problems with multimorbidity is it's really big, and actually it's too big to do anything about in its own right. You've got to choose to focus in on something. So I'm going to focus in on prescribing, and then high-risk prescribing, um, some antimicrobials, and then try and bring it back out again into um, polypharmacy. So the, the challenge of multimorbidity, so, so, so this is data from Scotland. This is for about one and three quarter million people in Scotland. It's about a third of the population. Um, and all it's doing is it's just taking data from GP records and it's counting how many of 40 conditions those people have. So 40, I mean, they're, they're, they're the more common conditions, um, but rare conditions are really common. So half my workload is stuff that's really rare. Half of it's the top 50 conditions. So this is definitely an underestimate what happens. And what you have is these are children aged 0 to 4, these are the over 85-year-olds, and these people with none, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or 8 or more of those 40 conditions. And it's not exactly rocket science that as you get older, you get more conditions. Um, what isn't quite so obvious from this presentation is that um, most people with any of the conditions have another. So multimorbidity isn't um, um, the exception, actually, it's normal. As you get into your 60s, then most people are multimorbid, and as you get into your 70s, most people have got three or more of these conditions. Um, the other thing that's not obvious from this is that actually there's more multimorbid people under 65 than over, and that's just because the population bulge. In other words, there's hardly any over 85-year-olds, even though there's more and more of them every year. The population bulge is here, and so most multimorbid people are younger. It's not just a problem of old people. Um, if you live in a very deprived area in Scotland, you get your multimorbidity 10 or 15 years earlier than if you live in the most affluent areas. And so this, this um, slide for people in the most deprived areas, everything just shifts to the left. Multimorbidity, though, is, you know, it, it's kind of everything. I mean, I've got multimorbidity. Most, many of you will have multimorbidity, but I never see a doctor because my morbidities never need me to. I just get on with them. Um, and so the pattern that you have really does matter. And so, so some of these combinations really don't matter. So this is showing for these conditions what percentage of people have got the column conditions. So, you know, 50% of people with coronary heart disease have hypertension. Who cares? Hypertension is completely contained in coronary heart disease. It doesn't complicate your care. It doesn't complicate your life in any way at all. On the other hand, um, people with heart failure, then about one in five of them got COPD. That's a problem. When you're breathless, well, heart failure, lungs, um, and the treatments um, overlap in ways which are not always helpful. Um, if you look over here, then, then the, the most distinctive pattern is these two things, which people who, who take a lot of painkillers, that's having a painful condition, and people with depression. And so about one in five people with any physical condition have those. And we know that if you have depression, then your physical disease outcomes are worse, but also your depression outcomes are worse if you've got physical disease with it. Um, and so you can argue that actually, you know, I mean, the, the, those two are probably the, the least well managed in all this. And actually, if you're a physical disease specialist, you have to be able to do something about depression. It's really common. It affects your patients a lot. But we tend not to. You know, we, we keep physical disease doctors and psychiatrists in different hospitals. They don't really talk to each other. They train in different settings. Um, historically, you couldn't get a blood pressure measured in a psychiatric hospital. You know, didn't do smoking cessation, even though that's what their patients were going to die on. So, so big divides, but the combination, you know, the combinations you have will make the difference. So in, in the NICE multimorbidity guideline, we spent ages talking about when does multimorbidity matter. So on our count, 20, 40 conditions, a quarter of the population have got multimorbidity. But you can't really do anything special to a quarter of the population. There isn't a resource for it. Um, if you count more conditions, you get about 60% of the population has got multimorbidity. But you can't, you know, most of the time it doesn't actually matter. So does my hay fever, my intermittent back pain, um, and my deafness really matter? Well, not to health services. So w w what we said was you, got, you actually can't specify this precisely, but, the, but there's two kind of dimensions. So one is um, the number and severity and complexity of the conditions you have. So I say, you know, type 2 diabetes and hay fever doesn't really matter. You know, diabetes matters, but the combination doesn't. If you've got diabetes, depression, blindness, rheumatoid arthritis, and you're frail, actually that really does matter. 
And on the blood clots, the amount of care you get. So if you're someone who intermittently goes to the GP, um, uses community pharmacy, you don't have particularly complex health care. Um, if you're someone who has um, got multiple acute and chronic primary care visits, specialist nursing care at home, you go to five outpatient clinics, you go into hospital a lot acutely, um, you've got a complex social care package, you've got lots of room for, t for things to go wrong. And so in general, as you move up there, you're going to have more problems with your multimorbidity. You need a different kind of approach. And in terms of safety, you can be harmed down here. Healthcare can kill you anywhere, but you're much more likely to be harmed up there. These are people endless, you know, you can't find the record because they were just in hospital last week. Um, lots of room for miscommunication, lots of room for things to go wrong. Um, the thing that's not on here then is then life expectancy and frailty. So if you're frail over and above your conditions, that makes a big difference. And if you don't have long to go, if you're predictably going to die in the next year or two, much of what we're doing to you is likely to be futile. And that futile treatment may well harm you. So how should health services respond? I mean, I'm not really going to this. This is from the guideline. I mean, I mean, I think the key thing I take from it is that actually, you know, what the patient values and what their priorities are have to be central. And the key question is, you know, what, what actually are we trying to achieve? What's the point of this? It's not to manage a disease. It's to manage the, the person. That's one question. And the second is, who's responsible? If someone is seeing 15 different people, who is responsible? Who's responsible for what? Who's responsible for the whole person? Um, and if you're not sure, the question you should be asking yourself is, well, should it be me? And so that's very common in general practice. You know, someone is seeing lots of people, including lots of GPs. If no one's in charge, then actually, should it be me? And if it, if it should be me, then I just have to step up and do that. So what should health services do? I mean, um, I kind of think about this in four, four ways. I mean, your health system needs strong generalism. And so in the UK, and I think here, um, that largely means um, general practice and care of the elderly, geriatrics. It doesn't have to. So, you know, people with renal failure on dialysis will get most of their generalist care from the renal unit, and that's fine. That's who they see all the time. So renal units can be a bit aggressive in how they do primary care, but, you know, they will take responsibility. Um, you can focus on kind of holistic management care coordination um, for people with very high need, but that's a minority sport. You don't have the resource to give everyone a, a, a care manager who goes and sees them every week and does things to them. Um, and so, so I, I, I'm going to kind of stay a bit further down that. So, so you can focus on specific problems that matter to people with multimorbidity. And so that's why I, one reason I do prescribing. And then you can focus on high volume processes. If you make discharge from hospital safer, then the people who benefit most are people with multimorbidity, because they're the people who go in and out of hospital all the time. And they're the people who are on lots of drugs. They're the people in whom things go wrong in medicine's reconciliation. If you're on two drugs, medicine's reconciliation is usually pretty straightforward because you can remember what they are, and they're not usually that important. When you're on 18 drugs, you're often a bit cognitively impaired. You're often sicker when you go in. You often can't tell the person what you're on, and if you can, you, you may get it wrong. Um, and those drugs may be much more critical to your health. So high volume processes isn't really about multimorbidity, but if you fix them, multi people with multimorbidity are the people who are most likely to benefit. So m moving to kind of think about well, you know, how, how might you improve, and, and so in, in Scotland at least, we have a dichotomy between what you might describe as traditional methods and new methods. So traditional methods are things like education guidelines, some kind of toolkit, um, you know, multidisciplinary teams, so you give me a pharmacist to help me do things in my practice, um, and incentives. So um, GPs in Scotland are private businesses, contracted to the NHS, and so payment systems matter. And there's lots of studies of these, that this is what research tends to focus on, so evaluate in trials, you do interrupt time series analysis. And actually, this is what health services do most of the time. They don't do improvement in the modern sense, they do this kind of stuff. Improvement in the modern sense is then rather different, um, and in Scotland the model that's really been gone with most widely is in Institute for Healthcare Improvement, so breakthrough collaboratives, using the model for improvement, often focused on saying let's find a problem, let's make a care bundle for it, so that's a set of typically four or five measures um, where you say for care to be good you have to do all of these things every time, that's what makes reliable care. Um, so based around measuring small samples repeatedly, small cycles of change, making small changes, remeasuring, making another change. It's all quite local. You're meant to be allowed to do things the way you want to do them. Um, and there's meant to be an element of shared learning. So what we do, we go and help other people do later. 
And that's typically evaluated by self-measurement. The care bundle is the outcome. That's measured by the team themselves. And that's, you know, commonly used method in large-scale improvement programs. It's, it's not the only method, but it's the one that Scotland bet the house on in the patient safety program. So patient safety program in Scotland, it was initially only in hospital um, and was then extended to primary care. So I was involved in a, a project which was the pre-runner to that. And, and so what, what this says is, well, okay, you need a flow. You've got some kind of patient flow or care flow, and you repeatedly sample from it. And to do that, you need a big enough flow. Um, and so you need, you know, and so there are ex examples in primary care where this works. These are, these are things that I do at high volume. So access is high volume. Every day in my practice, 3,100 patients. There are tens of phone calls or people coming to the desk wanting to be seen. Repeat prescribing is high volume. Monday evening, I sign 100 scripts. Um, results handling, less handling, medicines rec, meds rec. These are all things which involve me managing documents. Every Monday morning, I come in, I've got 30 to 40 documents to deal with. These are high flow processes you can sample from them. But most of what I do is not high volume in that sense. It's much low volume. And a lot of it is quite judgment based. So, so this is the warfarin bundle. Um, so we do this, we measure this every two to four weeks. We sample five patients. Um, and we measure these five things on those five sample patients. And so some of these work pretty well in this context. So have they been taking the advised dose? I can measure that every time, and it matters every time. Have they had their INR measured within seven days of when it was planned? I can measure that every time. It matters every time. Some are a bit trickier. So the warfarin dose is prescribed according to local guidance. Well, you know, what's the local guidance? You know, I'm the, I'm the one who's done it. I say, yeah. That was done right, even if, you know, a bit harder, harder to measure. And some of them are really quite hard to measure. So is the target INR and duration of treatment clearly documented? We're repeatedly measuring this, but we've only got 35 people on warfarin. So we're sampling five of them every time, and we keep sampling the same people. But actually, once I've written it down once, it's kind of written down. It doesn't really change. It doesn't change much. And have they received education in the last six months? So, so this one drives patients wild. So I sample you, and I said, have you had education in the last month? And they say, no. And I say, OK, here's some education. Great. And then they're sampled again four weeks later. And I said, have you had education in the last six months? And they say, yeah, you told me about this four months ago. And I said, oh, yes, I did. And then two months later, they're sampled again. They say, I've told you this already twice. And three weeks later, they're sampled again. And the reason that this person is being sampled so often is that most people on warfarin hardly ever have their INR done. Therefore, they hardly ever get sampled. It's only a small people of warfarin who get their INR done every one or two weeks, but they're the ones in this measure. So they're driven wild by this. They keep saying, you told you this, told you, stop asking. So the bundle, it, I mean, it does work. It, I think it's made warfarin care better. It doesn't quite work as a bundle because we just don't have a big enough flow to run this in. So moving kind of back, so now I'm moving into kind of more traditional improvement because that's where I spend my research life. Um, I want to talk a bit about polypharmacy. So, so polypharmacy is not a good or a bad thing in itself. It's the price of success. So we've got more effective treatments, therefore we give people more drugs. That's not a bad thing. And if you survive your heart attack, you automatically get four drugs added to your regime. That's not a bad thing either, because you've survived your heart attack. Um, however, it's frequently problematic. And so polypharmacy is always a mixture of giving people too much and giving them too little, because you can't bear to add another drug. But that other drug might be better than some of the ones they're on. I should say, you know, we're entirely focused on starting treatments. Nobody ever taught me how to stop anything. Um, and so we typically start stuff, and then we don't really review it. We don't really stop it. And so people just accumulate drugs, which four or five years down the road, no one can remember why it was started. No one can quite remember what it's for. Well, they must have hypertension because they're an antihypertensive, except they don't. They never did. Or if they did, they didn't, you know, did they need that drug? Um, and no one says, do, I, you know, do you still need it? So, so polypharmacy is an accretion of laying down of layers. It's like um, sediment. Um, but you need to be able to stop and think about it. Our training really doesn't help us with that. So this is, um, again, more Scottish data. This data from NHS Tayside, so population about 400,000 people. So this is dispensed prescribing data. We have a picture of every prescription dispensed in the last 20 years. Um, and again, this is young adults, older adults. This is from 1995, and it's just counting how many drugs each person has been dispensed in the last um, 84 days. 
So it's not just stuff they're taking on the day. It includes acute prescribing. Um, but antibiotics and so on are really important because they have loads of interactions. They're quite important safety risks. So down here, um, so this is people dispense no drugs, one drug, two drug, three drug, four drug, five, six, seven, eight, nine, change of color, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and then right down the bottom is 15 or more drugs. Um, so, you know, younger people, hardly anyone has prescribed more than four drugs. Um, older people in 1995, I mean, maybe a quarter are prescribed five or more. That's the conventional definition of polypharmacy. If you fast forward 15 years to 2010, it looks like that. So every age, people take more drugs. Um, now, in fact, the over 65s, half of them are taking five more drugs. About one in five of them are taking 10 or more drugs. And there's a slice of them taking 15 or more. It's not necessarily a bad thing. However, if you think about where our evidence comes from, it all comes from there. So randomized trials do not include really old people. In fact, they often don't include just old people. Um, and they don't include people taking lots of drugs who have got multimorbidity. And so these are the, this is the people for whom we know whether drugs are effective and safe, and we extrapolate to this group where we, you know, they're probably still effective, but they may not be safe, or they may be less safe, or at least the benefit-risk balance may be different. So does, does any of this matter? Um, so this is now the same data set, just looking at potentially risky prescribing. So there's people taking warfarin who are prescribed drugs which, if you're on warfarin, may be a problem to you, so non and antiplatelet drugs may make you bleed. If you bleed while you're on warfarin, you may be in trouble. And some antibiotics and um, oral antifungals um, put your INR up, predictably put it up, potentially doubling it, therefore put your bleeding risk. And what you see is that we're actually safer. So 16% of people in 1995, on 16% of people on warfarin in 1995 were prescribed one of these drugs, and it's now only 11%. So that's good. But if you look at the actual numbers, um, then it was 258 people in 95, and it's now 538. So it more than doubles. And the reason it doubles is because way more people are taking warfarin. And that's a good thing, because warfarin and atrial fibrillation is one of the most effective treatments there is. That's really great. But that we're safer, but actually we're putting more people at risk, because we're using more and more drugs. And so polypharmacy is not right or wrong, but as we use more and more drugs in people, you need more vigilance about adverse events. You need more thought about individual benefit risk because we're actually harming more people. So zooming in a bit more, so this is into high-risk prescribing. So, so I've been interested in prescribing, you know, it's the commonest thing I do to people, apart from just seeing them. Um, so it's high benefit, it's high risk, it's high cost. So about 6.5% of hospital admissions are related to adverse drug effects. And mostly these are appropriate drugs. These aren't drugs that you look at and think, God, that's really dangerous. These are antihypertensives, they're aspirin, um, they're renal toxic drugs, they're drugs to lower blood sugar. This is normal drugs with low risk of harm, where so many of them are used, that's where all the harm is. The harm isn't in really risky drugs. The harm is in commonly used low to moderate risk drugs. Um, so these aren't, all, none of this prescribing is a never event, okay? So if you cut the wrong leg off, you should never do that. It's quite clear. You prescribe one of these drugs, one of these risky combinations, well, you know, it would be right in some people, but wrong in others. We don't know what the right level is. Um, what we do know is that, so, so this is, I mean, percentage of people who are getting a high-risk prescription um, is largely driven by the number of drugs you're on. In other words, as you take more and more chronic drugs, then you get more and more people getting high-risk prescriptions. That's what you expect. Sick people are sick in multiple ways. They need more prescribing, but they're also the ones who then get the harm from it. Um, so what have people done about it? So, so there's been three big trials in primary care, um, all in the UK, which have targeted high-risk prescribing. Um, so the first one was done in England by Tony Avery in Nottingham. It's called PINSA. It's a cluster randomized trial in 72 practices. So the control arm get feedback on one occasion about their rates of high-risk prescribing, and they get written education. And this is a bundle of about, I've forgotten now, 12 or 13 measures. Um, three of them would find as the primary outcome. The intervention arm get a pharmacist who comes in and helps the practice review the drugs. That's mostly the pharmacist reviewing the drugs and then going to talk to GPs about it. And then they were also meant to do some work with the practice to implement system changes for future improvement. So these are their three primary outcomes, so non in people with peptic ulcer in the past, um, uh, beta blockers prescribed people with asthma, 
and people who, who needed monitoring who haven't had it done. And what you see is that at six months, then about a quarter to a half this prescribing is got rid of. That's great. Um, but the effect kind of wears off a bit. So, so the issue about they were meant to change the future, changing the future was harder than just changing the prescribing that people were on. And so by six months, the effect sizes are somewhat lower. So we then have done two trials in Scotland. So this is the first one, so um, it's called DQIPS. This was a cluster randomized step wedge trial, which I'll explain in a second, in 33 practices. And we were focusing on high risk non steroidal antiplatelet prescribing. We focused on that because antiplatelets and non steroidals are the commonest cause of hospital admission um, due to adverse drug effects. Um, and because they're largely under the control of the GP. And I'll come back to that. So in a step wedge trial, you, you, you take all your practices, everyone gets the intervention. Um, but you randomize them to start at different times. So you measure your outcome repeatedly over time, and then at this point, four, um, three practices start, um, you measure again, another three practices start, you measure again, you randomize them to start time, and then we turn the intervention off after a year and we keep measuring. So it's all done in routine data, and so you can measure fairly well. And the intervention was um, they got one educational outreach from a pharmacist lasting one hour. Um, they got an informatics tool which took data in their own record to identify patients, to support the review process and track progress, and then we paid them £15 for every review that they completed. If they reviewed the same patient again later in the year, they wouldn't pay them again. We paid them once per year. So about €20, Euros, well, it's probably about €5 Euros now. Um, the, so a small incentive. But we didn't pay them to change the prescribing. We said, whatever you do is up to you. We can't tell whether this prescribing is right or wrong. We just want you to look and to then make a judgment. And you get similar effects to PINSA. So all, the, 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 all high-risk prescribing reduced by, by about 37%. Um, we were asking them to look at people who were receiving the prescribing. That's the ongoing prescribing. And that reduces by about the same. But we also then looked to see whether they then changed, whether they initiated this prescribing. And the answer is they did. Um, and so what that means is, so, so, so if you remember, these practices are all starting at different times. If you put all the practices on the same timeline, then these are the measurements before they start. That's the start of the intervention. So you get a fairly quick reduction, and when you turn the intervention off, it sustains itself. And that's really important, because if you don't sustain improvement, we don't have the resource to keep doing the same thing over and over again. You've got to put your improvement resource back into something else later. There's lots of things to fix. And then it also reduced emergency admission with related adverse effects. Um, so GI bleeding and heart failure. So it didn't, adduce, didn't significantly reduce acute kidney injury, although the odds ratio is the same way. So it works, but it's all quite complicated. And the NHS said, well, you know, that's going to be hard to do in real life. Um, but I'll show you a real life example. So the second one was then much simpler. This is a, a cost randomized trial. It's in 260 practices. So that's about a quarter of Scotland. Um, every practice in the targeted areas took part, largely because we just didn't ask them. Um, so it's a feedback trial, we just sent them feedback, we didn't ask their permission to do that. I mean, that's what the NHS does anyway. You know, it sends me stuff, I can choose to throw it away or read it as I wish. So it's targeting six measures, it's got three arms. So the usual care arm gets more than normal. They get some written education, but they also get some support for searching, which isn't normal. There's a feedback arm that gets quarterly feedback for a year. And then the, a third arm gets the same, plus a written behavior change intervention. All done in the NHS, so the NHS is sending this out. And this is what you get. So you get your practice rate on each of the measures, you get a, base, you get a comparator, and the benchmark is the 25th centile. In other words, three quarters of practices are worse than benchmark. That's standard NHS Scotland practice. Um, and you then get a bit of text about what's being measured, why does it matter? And then this bit down here, what you get depends on what that shows. It's a written interpretation of the graph, but it's all done automatically, and there's no humans involved in this. Um, and that's because some people don't understand graphs. You think well, everyone understands a, a graph, but actually, that's not true. And what we found is that the, both intervention arms are effective. You get a much smaller effect. It's about 12% reduction in high-risk prescribing. Um, if you then look at each arm individually, so this is the usual care arm, they got written education and support for searching, nothing happens. That's what the research literature tells you. If you just send people written material, nothing happens. You've got to have a better in implementation strategy. So it's much less effective, but on the other hand, it's way cheaper. 
way, way cheaper. You don't need much human bodies. Once you build the IT, um, it costs you nothing to send 300 emails. Um, so does it work in real life? Um, so this is data from Fourth Valley. It's the Scottish Health Board. It's about 350,000 people. So they, 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 they took all this and said, well, we, we don't like either of those, but we're going to do a dequit like intervention, which they invented themselves, and we're going to use three of the measures from the EFIPS trial because we didn't like the dequit one. Um, and, and it was part of a wider improvement program they had um, where there's a small financial incentive to engage. They did an educational workshop. They did a single round of feedback at the beginning, and they helped the practices find the patients, and then they just left them to get on with it. And in year one, they target three non and antiplatelet measures. So this is the time series across the board. This is the rate. This is when they turn the intervention on. They get a big reduction. They turn it off, and they go back to trend. So they get about a 50% reduction. That's bigger than any of the trials. It's not normally that way around. Trials are normally more effective than um, real life. So that's really great. It does translate. Um, so they liked it so much that they, the next year they then picked another measure from EFIPS, which they, they didn't do in the first year because they thought it might be harder. And so this one was antipsychotic prescribing in over 75s. That's a proxy for antipsychotic prescribing to older people with dementia. So this is the single most lethal thing that GPs ever do. So in the UK, um, in 2009, it was estimated this killed about 1,800 people, and it caused about another 1,600 strokes. Um, if they weren't old and with dementia, that would be a scandal requiring major action. Um, but in fact, it's kind of just normal business. So not always an avoidable prescription, but um, almost certainly overuse these drugs. Um, little thought on when you start them, when you're going to stop them. Um, and if we were doing anything else that killed 1,800 people a year, I, I don't think it would have slid under the radar. So they do the same intervention and absolutely nothing happens. Okay, um, so fantastically effective for one kind of prescribing, fantastically ineffective for another. And so it doesn't translate at all. It kind of does though, because th this was what, another one of the EFIPS measures, and we saw the same pattern in EFIPS. Five of the measures changed, but this one didn't. No magic bullet, you can't do anything which is going to reliably work. And the reason I think this doesn't work is that this is a prescribing that no one owns. So most non steroidals in primary care, I feel they belong to me. And psychotics are usually started by specialists in the UK. Um, and therefore, I, but they never follow the patient up. The prescribing is not owned by anyone. There's a lot of fear about stopping them, um, even though the trial evidence is that nothing happens when you do stop them. So that's all fine. I mean, you know, I mean, I think there's, there's good evidence you can change prescribing and make it safer. Um, I was going to switch to a slightly different kind of prescribing, um, since I know you're going to be talking about it later. So this is antimicrobial prescribing. Um, we're doing a systematic review of um, drugs to, sorry, um, interven interventions to improve antimicrobial prescribing in primary care. It's not quite finished yet. The bottom line is um, you get small effects, but almost everything works. And these things are you know, educational outreach, um, educational workshops, feedback, sometimes incentives, guideline implementation beyond just sending the guideline out. Um, everything works, really. Um, and I guess a feature of my life has been that everyone says, oh, you can't change antimicrobial prescribing. We've been trying to do it for years. As a GP, hardly anyone's ever tried to change my antimicrobial prescribing. There's a lot of talk about it. There's not a huge amount of action that ever makes it down to my level in practice. So, so Scotland has been doing work on this um, for the last uh, six, seven years. And in 2009, they targeted 4C antimicrobial prescribing. So that's coamoxiclav, cephalosporin, uh, fluoroquinolones, by which we mean ciprofloxacin, and clindamycin. So clindamycin isn't used by medical prescribers, but it's quite commonly used in dental prescribing. And dental prescribing is about 10% of community antimicrobial use. Um, often forgotten, uh, but important. So, so these drugs were targeted because they're high risk of C. difficile, which is a, a big problem in, um, in Scotland at the time. And health boards were kind of left to get on and do what they wanted, but they were all required to do something. Um, and, and so in Tayside, we evaluated this in a time series analysis. Um, and what you see is, um, so this is total antimicrobial prescribing, which doesn't change at all in this period, and these are four Cs. And so when they, when they started doing something about it in an active way, 
having, you know, there's been a lot of hand-wringing about broad-spectrum prescribing in the community over this period, nothing happens. If you just do something about it, actually, you get a very, very large reduction quite quickly. And if you look at that by age group, so these are children, um, young to middle-aged people, older people, and these are people in care homes. So these are the people most at risk from um, C. diff and others. And, you know, they, get, they drop to less than a sixth of their level. So this intervention works in people that you want it to work in, which is people at the highest risk. Um, and the difference between um, this period and that period was that actually someone put some resource into changing my prescribing. That's what it takes. You put some resource into it and you, you keep coming to me and telling me it's important. That's fine. You can change prescribing. Um, just to complete the loop, um, so based on this and based on EFIPS, they're currently doing a feedback trial in 380 practices, which is targeting total use. So this was a this was narrowly focused intervention, um, and the big thing is how do you actually reduce total use? Although I'll come back to that. So okay, you get these big reductions in antimicrobial use. Um, one of the questions then is, well, does it make any difference to resistance? So we all believe that if you use more antibiotics, you get more resistance. There's very little data about whether if you reduce your antibiotic use, you get less resistance. So not easy to do. So the, easy, the easiest way to measure this is in urine culture. But urine culture is, is problematic because you get sampling bias. So we don't send urines on everyone we think who has a urine infection. The people we're most likely to send urine cultures on are people who haven't responded to an antibiotic. In other words, they probably have a resistant organism. Um, so we chose not to do urine culture. We decided we were going to look at resistance in gram-negative community-acquired bacteremia. So these are people in hospital on, who, on day, in the first two days of admission, have a blood culture which grows either an E. coli, a Klebsiella, or a Proteus. Um, this is a, a kind of, you know, these are serious infections, high mortality, about 30% of them die. Um, and um, gram-negatives are, are what's going up. Gram-positive bacteremia is falling because of changes in how hospitals use lines, but this is going up. And what you find is that for fluoroquinolones and cephalosporins, you do get changes in resistance compared to what you might expect. So this is fluoroquinolones, so back in 2005, about 6% of bacteria of gram-negative bacteremia is a resistant fluoroquinolones. It's going up, it's about 10% when the intervention happens, and it then falls. And so the, that 39% reduction is the difference between that and that at three years. So that's quite important. Um, Carmax, Carmax cloud makes no difference. And so actually the, the impact you get on resistance probably partly depends on whether there's a cost to the organism of retaining resistance. And so fluoroquinolone resistance, there's a cost to the organism of maintaining it. If you take away the antibiotic, it will fall. Cloud, probably the horse is already gone. Um, okay, so I'm conscious of the time. I'll skip through some of this other stuff. So, so polypharmacy interventions, um, lots, much harder not to crack. So if you're looking at specific prescribing, small numbers of patients, quite easy to identify. You're asking people to go and review one or two things. Polypharmacy is just too big. There's been lots of um, pharmacist-led medication review trials, all a bit inconclusive, it should be said. Um, Scotland and Wales have produced polypharmacy guidance, which is actually pretty good, but it's 50 pages long. It's quite hard to use in a consultation. Um, and so we've been doing some work um, in two health boards about developing informatics tools to support review. Um, and so these tools, don't, when, you don't expect them to work in themselves. You have to embed them in a, in a wider context of reviewing. Um, and what we produce is a piece of paper. Is take stuff in your electronic record and it turns it into a printable summary. And the reason you have to print it is that all the people at highest risk are not in the surgery. They're housebound or they're in care homes. So if you build something that only works electronically, you can't take it to the house. You, know, you can take the record on a tablet, but then you can't see anything because the tablet screen is too small to fit all the information. Um, so first page is largely saying, um, you know, what, what are the goals of drug therapy? Remember that question, what are we trying to achieve here? Well, actually, that's, the, that's central to polypharmacy review. It's not the drugs, it's what's the point of our care. So what does the patient and the carer want? What actually are we trying to achieve here? We're not trying to achieve disease control very often. Well, we may be, that might be the goal. But if disease control isn't the goal, then what is the goal? Um, we provide you some information about um, Things you need to know when doing a polypharmacy review, so what's your renal function, um, what's your blood pressure, 
Um, it gives you some information about recent unscheduled care use. Um, well, th this is all in the record, but it's all over the place. You know, if I want to find this in the record, I have to go and look in multiple screens. And if I want it all in one place, I have to handwrite it. Um, we take about 120 measures, so stop, start, and um, some others. And we then tell you which of them the patient triggers. So we don't expect you to remember 120 measures and work it out yourself. We tell you which one they trigger. So you might say, you know, I mean, some of them, this is a high-risk one, so that this person's on drugs which cause constipation. So you might say, well, that's not really very high risk. Actually, big effects on quality of life, much underestimated effects on quality of life. And the Sharp Island, you might have noticed, this person actually spent 12 days in hospital with constipation in the last year, two emergency admissions. Um, so not just the stuff you might think is really risky, the stuff which is important, which kind of isn't risky, but really matters to patients. Um, we show you the drug list, but we then show you overlapping side effects. So this person's on two anticholinergics, three sedative drugs, three constipating drugs, um, and so on. So does this work? I don't know. But, but it, once you get into a world of complexity, you need something that gives the, the clinician um, something relatively simple to get. What, you, you need to organize the complexity in a way which focuses on the decision you're trying to get them to make. Um, and so I think probably this kind of tool should help. Will it work? Don't know. You have to wait till the trials are done. So, I mean, kind of wrapping up, you know, multimorbidity is most of healthcare. It's kind of too big to fix. You can't, you can't deal with multimorbidity. You need to think about what's a digestible chunk. So my chunk is prescribing. You need to decide what matters to you. You need to pick a plausible method. I mean, there's no magic bullet. There's no, there's no one thing that's going to work. And if people come selling you one thing that's going to work, then they're, they're probably deluding you. I really think data matters, really, really matters. Um, but it's not the only thing that matters. Um, and so, you know, you, you've probably all heard this one. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's a quote from Walter Deeming. Um, there is a counter quote from Einstein, which is... Um, not everything that matters can be measured, not everything that can be measured matters. But actually, um, Walter Deeming, De Deeming did say this, but he didn't quite say it like that. This is what Deeming actually said. It's wrong to suppose that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, a costly myth. So measurement really, really matters, but actually the human side really, really matters as well. And understanding the context, you can rarely do just by measuring. But actually, if there's one thing I'd say, you know, is just get on with it. Okay, we know a lot about improvement and a bit about antibiotics. The problem isn't that we don't know how to change antibiotic prescribing. It's just that we never did it. And if you just get on with it, things will change. What does improvement look like? Um, it doesn't look like transformation. You know, people kind of think, oh, we'll do this, and a year later, everything will be fixed. That's probably hardly ever true. Um, so this is total antimicrobial prescribing in Scotland by deprivations. These are the most deprived fifth, the least deprived fifth. This is over three years, and over three years, total antimicrobial prescribing falls by 10% across the board. So that's what success looks like. Um, it looks like small changes persistently done over time. If this continues, which of course it may not, um, you know, in another three years, then you have a 20% reduction. And so 20% reduction is enormous in this context. Um, but that's what success looks like. It's grinding away at something until it works. It's not about transformational change, which fixes it in the next year. So, so what should health service respond? I mean, you know, you need to pick what matters to you. There's lots of things. You can do holistic management. There's good evidence for comprehensive geriatric assessment in hospitals as a way of improving quality of life and preventing nursing home admission and future hospital admission. You can focus on specific things. So I say I do prescribing, but you should do what matters to you. Um, I think you can do high volume processes, and that's where a lot of improvement has gone. And the main beneficiaries are people with multimorbidity. Um, so take your pick. You know, line care, central line care really works. If you want to do something, you know, you should do that because it will really work. Um, some of the other stuff, who knows? You need to make it work for yourself. So this is, of course, always the work of many, many, many people, and I should acknowledge all my collaborators and. I have to take a question. Do we have any questions? Maybe I might, sorry, we have one here. 
you might, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, if I'm a bit deaf. So you'll, if, you, you're if, if, if you might just, there's a, there is a microphone. We'll get it around to each of the questioners. You might just start by introducing yourself uh, um, first of uh, all before us. Nulo Connor, um, uh, GP. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Godfrey, for that um, uh, talk, which uh, reminds me a lot of the stuff that I actually do um, in general practice every day. Um, have you solved the problem at all of? Um, discharges from hospital and um, you know patients go in on one set of drugs they come out on a different set of drugs and as a GP you have 14 um, prescriptions you don't know what was stopped was it meant to be stopped why was it stopped what was added and why was it added yeah so I I mean normal business for GPs I mean I should say also normal business for hospitals because we don't always tell them what they're on when they go in so True. Um, I mean, it was one of the topics that the forerunner of the Scottish Patient Safety and Programme in Primary Care looked at. Um, certainly, hospital discharge information is often really poor. Um, in Scotland, it's become much, much better in that you normally are now told what was deliberately stopped, and therefore you know what was never known about in the first place, because it wasn't deliberately stopped, and you know what was started and why. And usually, you get some recommendation about what you're meant to do about the changes. Um, so, so you can certainly improve it from that point of view. You do need to think about the other on the other way in, though. If you don't tell them what they're on, how could they possibly get it right when they come out? And the other the, the other element of of what we did in Scotland was okay. Even if the information is imperfect, you have still got to manage it. And so, what's a safe way of managing imperfect information? So it's very easy to say, oh, well, it's all the hospital's fault. And so, even when it is all the hospital's fault, you've still got to do what you're going to do safely. Um, and practices vary quite a lot on how they do that. So I agree, really big problem. It's also paralleled by hospital letters. Um, so hospital letters will often have recommendations for doing stuff embedded in the fourth paragraph in the middle. Okay, I've got 40 documents to look at. I've got about 30 minutes to do them. And therefore, if you don't make it clear what I'm meant to do, I will miss them. On the other hand, the hospital at least writes to us every time we see them, they see someone, we never write to the hospital except at referral. So our communication the other way is poor. Um, so, so I wouldn't frame it as a problem of hospital discharge in the sense of the hospital. That is a problem. We have a real problem of communication across the, the interface where both sides have problems. Um, and we could all do it better. Thank you. Philip. Thanks, Bruce. Great presentation, very thought-provoking. Philip Crowley is my name, National uh, Director for Quality Improvement in the HSE. You, you presented various studies and various initiatives, that some of which sustained, some of which didn't improve, and some of which didn't sustain. And I suppose, from our perspective, working nationally and trying to improve things like uh, reducing pressure ulcers, etc., what, what, what what, in, on reflection, what do you think are the key drivers of actually sustaining improvement? Because that sometimes is the big challenge, isn't it? I I, I guess two things really, I mean, and one is ownership. You know, who actually owns the problem? And, and so, you know, if you think again about hospital discharge summaries, I don't own the hospital discharge summary. But the problem is the hospital doesn't own the problem of meds rec in my world. And, and so identifying who's going to own that problem, who's going to do something about it. If it's not owned, then any special program you do will tend to fizzle out because the only people who own it are the improvers. So you, do, you have some improvement resource, they own it, they make everyone change, but unless it's owned longer term, I don't think it was, or it, it's like it may fizzle out. Um, so, so one's ownership. The, the, the other is just how hard it is to do the improvement. You know, if it takes a lot of resource to do the improvement, then it, when your resource then goes off to do something else, it's likely to fizzle out. Um, and and I guess one of my worries about the IHI model is that it's a very engaging model. You know, you get your collaborative, you all come together, you meet, and, um, but what do you do when that stops happening? Um, you know, how do you sustain that engagement? Or, put another way, how do you decide what you're going to drop? You know, we've done that, it's good enough. We need to stop doing that so we can do something else. And so in, in the acute sector in Scotland, you do get wards which are simultaneously trying to run you know, six or seven care bundles, and they spend a lot of time collecting the data. And then you add another one, they collect more data. But the more data you collect, the less improvement you actually do, because you don't have time to do it. You're too busy collecting data. And I think those tensions are very hard. 
it's almost inevitable that when you turn something off, it will get a bit worse. And the question is, if it's safety critical, you just got to keep going with it. If it's important but not absolutely critical, well, you probably just have to tolerate that it's a bit worse, revisit it a bit later, do a bit more work but not as much later on. But I, I don't know. I think it's very hard to fix. It's very hard to make a lot of this stuff reliable. Um, some of it's culture, though. So, so I'd say historically, the, the discharge summaries in Scotland haven't changed. They always had the same boxes. It's just no one ever filled in some of them. Um, and I think what they did was they just said to pharmacy in the hospital, you don't dispense the drug unless that box is filled in. So you give hassle to the person doing it, and to avoid that hassle, they take the hassle of filling in the, in the box. You then make it electronic so that you can track changes over time without the poor house officer who's never seen the patient before going back through seven drug charts to work out what was done when none of it's written down as to why that was stopped or not stopped. So you, you make it easy to keep the record, which makes it easy to fill in the box, and then you force them to fill in the box by refusing to dispense the medicine. Um, and it, it has, it's completely changed over three years. It just, it, yeah. So what then happened was that the Scottish Patient Safety Programme Primary Care came to us to do repeated measurement of meds rec in primary care. So we were now getting information which was better. How do you then change how we handle that information? And I think that has been effective. Probably have time for maybe two or three other quick questions. Down at the back here. Thanks. And thanks very much, Kieran Brown from the Acute Hospitals Division in the HSC. Um, thanks very much for an, a very good talk. Um, it appears, Professor, that what you talked about a lot, in Ireland we seem to be very focused and probably fixated on service improvement. But what you seem to be talking about much more is around practice improvement. And the two, while interconnected, are obviously very, very distinct. So it would just seem to me logical as to why we don't train when we're training our health professionals, not only to do the technical side of care, but to be that sort of animal when we come back, when they come out of their training schools, to be able to actually improve through these methods. And it just appears that what we try to do lots of times is take people who are already trained and then remold them without actually teaching those skills from day one. So is there any reflections on that difference between service improvement and practice improvement? Because that seemed to be not the magical bullet, but definitely an important component of what you were talking about. Yeah, I, I, I mean, people often say it's harder to do improvement in primary care. I, I think it's actually easier because the organisations are all much smaller. You know, if you can persuade a practice, then they just go and, you know, they'll go and do it. You don't, there's no bureaucracy, there's no management, there's no big complexity. Um, how, how do you change it? You know, I mean, I, I don't know what Irish medical schools are like. When I trained, I was taught to diagnose people and to treat them. That was about it. I wasn't taught anything else. I wasn't taught how to um, prescribe. I wasn't taught... Um, anything, well, there were many useful things I wasn't taught. My first day on the wards, the registrar turns to me and says, prescribe some paracetamol and suppositories for this patient. And I pick up the chart with my pen, and I realise I don't know what to do. And one of the nurses shows me how to fill in a drug chart. Um, so, so that's changed. I mean, medical training is more focused on the practical now. Some medical schools are going down the road of, of making improvement part of the curriculum. So Dundee has gone down that road quite heavily. Um, and so IHI run a student kind of forum thing where you can submit your quality improvement projects, and about a third of them come from Dundee. You know, you can do it, but you have to make space in the curriculum. The question then is, what do you not do in the curriculum? And people say, oh, but, you know, you've got to know how to examine ears. Well, you kind of do, but most doctors never examine ears. <laughs> you know, GPs do, but surgeons never do, um, I don't think. Um, so, you know, there's a lot in the curriculum where we train people a little bit across a whole pile of clinical stuff, which if you can do it in real life, you could just learn it when you were actually doing it for real, I think. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you could change curriculum. Um, but the, the core, I don't think, is the techniques. I think the core is who's responsible. You know, it's, take it, it's accepting that you're responsible for what you do, but you're also responsible for how your system works, whatever your system is. Um, and again, that's, there's been changes in that in Scotland. Um, so managed clinical networks have kind of said to specialists, you're responsible for um, coronary heart disease care or ischemic heart disease care in the health board. 
And it doesn't matter whether it's you doing it or someone else doing it, you have responsibility for it. And if you think it's been done badly somewhere, you have to go and do something about it. Um, but that's all, it's a slow business. So managed clinical networks are over 10 years old. They're probably only now getting effective. Hello, my name is Clara and I work for um, a unit that specialises in older patient care. Do you think that there's, um, there's a situation where some doctors are afraid to take patients, to take medication from patients? To, to, uh, I, I'm thinking of perhaps situations where patients have been on a, a, a medication and the person has deteriorated, their status has deteriorated to such an extent that you would query whether certain drugs are really um, effective in that patient's particular case, but the doctor is afraid to take them off because they're feeling that they might come under pressure from family. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, you know, I, I think we all feel that and, you know, so a remarkable number of people who are predictably dying die on their statin. Um, or, or die on their drugs for tight glycemic control, all of which are drugs, you know, they work in prevention, but they have small effects over very long periods of time. So these are long game drugs. If you don't have a long game to play, your benefit from them has to be low. Statins probably don't make you feel ill, controversial, but yeah, I mean, they probably don't. Hyperglycemic drugs do make you ill. If you become hyperglycemic and fall over, then falls are dangerous to you. Um, but we're fearful of the risks, and, and so you know you stop the statin, they have a heart attack the next day. It can't be anything to do with stopping the statin, but you worry that someone's going to blame you for it. Um, but that's why you have to talk to the patient about it. So um, wh wh when you're stopping drugs, so, so, so there are some outcomes that people are really keen to avoid, typically more keen than others. Um, so stroke is a much more feared outcome than heart attack, typically. Um, and so some people will want to be on stroke-preventive medication to the bitter end because they're so frightened about not being on it. And that's probably okay. I, mean, you know, I think that's reasonable, but you need to talk to the patient to understand that. M my own experience is that I think p patients quite often give you offers or families give you offers about wanting to talk about it. And so patients, I think, often express it as jokes. They say things like, I'm rattling, or they make a joke about the number of pills they take. And you can treat it as a joke, or you can treat it as a serious offer to have a conversation about the number of pills they're taking. And I have never really come across patients or family who, who didn't want to have that conversation. They might want to do something about it which is different than me, and, but, you know, that's fine. I mean, you know, I, I'm not... I would avoid stopping any, everything my, anything myself if, I, if possible. If you talk to people about it, stopping stuff is usually not that hard, but it leads you into very dangerous territory because you, inevitably you end up talking about dying. You're dying of something else, therefore this treatment in you is futile. But that can easily shade into, you know, your toast. You're not worth treating anymore. And that's very, very, that's a difficult conversation. But you'd need to ask the patient or their carer. So if people with impairment, you have to speak to the carer. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for that presentation. Tim Delaney is my name. I'm from Tala Hospital Pharmacy Department. Um, uh, just a quick observation on what Nula O'Connor said there earlier. I think um, we have huge challenges uh, in, in this area of communication between hospitals and general practice, but there are some good things that have happened uh, here in recent years. We now have standards for communication which were produced by HICWA, which were not there in the past. and, and We've already published our adherence to those standards in our discharge communications on prescribing from, from Tala Hospital. So I think one of the things we all need to start doing is maybe to focus on these things and, and make them more salient and more important. I was, I was very struck that you said about case management and the need for process to be owned by somebody. And uh, 
one of my heroes in pharmacy is uh, Professor Linda Strand, who, who in 1990 published uh, an article called Opportunities and Responsibilities in Pharmaceutical Care, and she said that pharmacists should be taking ownership of the pharmaceutical care of patients, and that if they didn't, somebody would, but I think somebody hasn't yep. quite yet. Uh, could, could you comment on wh what your arrangements are with pharmacy in Scotland? Do you have pharmacists working in general practice? Yes, so it, it varies by board. Every board employs pharmacists who, um, so practice pharmacists who do work in practices, and they're normally attached. So, um, when you, you know, when, if you're trying to get pharmacists and doctors to work together, then typically um, you run the risk of professional tension between them about who's going to control the work and who's in charge. Um, and that usually all goes away once they know each other. In other words, you need to be working in a team that has a relationship with each other, not have an unknown person parachuting into your practice to do stuff. And so, so, that you're, so you classically get an attached pharmacist. In my practice, we got half a day a week. Well, that's just gone up to a day a week. In, so that's in NHS Fife. In Tayside, they, my practice would get two days a week. So it varies. But almost everything they've done historically has been about cost. So that, that was the business case for practice pharmacy, was that you could, you could reduce primary care costs. Um, and it's only in the last few years that they've actually got into either safety or wider care, and that government in Scotland and in England has committed to putting more pharmacists into primary care, and they've said that they're not going to be about cost. They're going to be about safety and better care. Whether that survives austerity is hard to know. Um, the, yeah, so I, I, I think, you know, you have to do it. What, the pharmaceutical care literature is a bit mixed. It doesn't really show that it makes any difference, but my critique of it would be that's largely because it's unintegrated. It takes a pharmacist to do pharmaceutical care who's not connected to the prescribing team, and actually what you need is you need a pharmacist in the team. You don't need external services. You need that expertise within your team. If I could ask... Is this working? Yeah. If I could ask maybe just one final question. Um, it just looking at this from a public health point of view, and we look at, the, if we, we look, look at scale and impact as two determinants of... of, of the overall public health impact. In many respects, some of what you've said is reminding us that the impact in primary care at a pu public health level could be much greater, even if the individual impact of some of the patient safety incidents is, yeah. is not nearly as, 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 as large. Uh, and we see a lot of focus, and it's a particular feature in this country, of perhaps less frequent but high impact yeah. hospital-based. And some of that creates a challenge in terms of engaging primary care in a broad sense with the agenda of patient safety or people seeing primary care as an important setting for improving patient safety at the public health level. It seems to me in Scotland that you have important features of your healthcare system that we don't readily have the scale of information, the nature of your primary care system and its organisation are key attributes, it seems to me. Is there a difference, or, 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 or am I right in sensing it, in the way in which your primary care system is either engaged with the agenda of primary care or how easier or easy it is uh, to engage them uh, as compared to as compared to ours, or could you give us a sense of that? I, I, I mean, and we, we've had 20 years of cost-focused work, you know, so we're all used to the board coming to us and making us change prescribing for cost. Um, safety is a much easier sell, you know. So, so people would rather do safety work than cost work, although most people recognise cost is is reasonable. Um, so, so we've never really found safety a particularly hard sell. Um, in, in the collaborative, in the, the primary care collaborative, then um, first meeting and some other meetings um, would always start with a, you know, my name's Bruce and I'm a, an unsafe GP talk. So, so what I mean by that is that we all have stories we can tell about stuff that went horribly wrong, and it's usually normal business stuff. So, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, the person in the letter comes in from the hospital saying, you know, woman with terminal lung cancer, in retrospect, the, the, the lesion was visible on an x-ray three years ago. You go looking for the x-ray. The x-ray report says um, there is a well-defined round opacity three centimeters wide in the um, left upper lobe, urgent CT scan and referral to chest clinic is required. And you think, you know, and so, so that one as it happened wasn't ours, it was a, yeah. 
a complicated one, but you know, that kind of thing, everyone has experienced that. And so those kind of stories, I think, really matter. This is data beyond the measurable. The, the data side, I mean, you almost certainly have enough data to do most of what we've done, but not for your whole population. Um, so I think your, um, you know, your state-funded care population, you have all that prescribing data centrally, so you have enough data on practices to do something to every practice. Um, the difficulty is always getting that data in a place and a shape that you can actually turn it into product for the practice. And it costs you money, and you need programmers. It's not a statistical problem. You need a programmer to do it for you. I don't think there's anything terribly special about us. Um, I mean, our big problem at the moment is that primary care is just falling over. So my practice is 30% under-doctored. Um, you know, you just don't have time to do stuff. Um, all the practices in my area are just about ready to go because all of them are running short of doctors um, and or nurses. Um, so the big problem for us going forward is that actually primary care is falling over. Workload's going up 2 or 3% a year. Income is falling 1% a year. And that's an unsquareable circle. 